We live in a material world. For my purposes today, though, I want to say we live in a soft material world. And by soft materials, I mean synthetic polymers, or what you all know, may know better as plastics. Synthetic polymers have improved our lives in almost every facet of our daily experience. Just think of your morning routine. You probably wake up and brush your teeth with a toothbrush that has bristles of just the right mechanical properties. You keep your coffee warm in a plastic thermos. You put synthetic polymers in your hair and on your face. And, very important for us all here in South Dakota, the insulation in your coat that keeps you warm and the, and the coating that keeps you dry are both made of synthetic polymers. But the grand scientific challenges we face in our future will not be solved by the same polymers that keep you warm every day. Scientists need to make polymers that perform new functions. We need to make them smarter, more functional, and more sustainable. That's my job as a synthetic chemist. I make molecules. Specifically, I'm an expert at making new synthetic polymers. But what exactly is a polymer? So poly means many, and mer means unit. So a polymer is many small units connected together to make one large molecule, as you can see in this accompanying image. Many of these small spheres are connected together through a reaction to make one large macromolecule. So, as a chemist who figures out how to make new polymers, I'm trying to think of ways to connect these units together in new, interesting, and potentially useful ways. And what excites me is that if we can figure out the right combination of units and connections to generate polymers with complex functions, these materials hold tremendous potential to transform our approach to problems in human health, energy storage, and sustainability. Specifically, I dream of a day where a synthetic polymer can wrap up a metastasizing cancer cell and prevent it from implanting somewhere else in the body. Or a day where synthetic polymers can provide a matrix where you can actually regrow tissue after organ damage. Or even a day where synthetic polymers can help us provide the relevant grid-scale energy storage to power our sustainable energy future. The bottleneck holding many of these transformative opportunities back, however, is a current Herculean effort needed to make new polymers. Currently, making even a small collection of polymer samples requires people like me, <laughs> shown here in my lab at MIT. The problem is, there aren't enough people who make polymers right now. And even if there were, the current approaches we have to make these materials are very tedious. I've been trained in this field for approximately eight years right now, and it still takes me about two days to make a polymer sample relevant for testing. To do the necessary high-throughput screening that we would ideally like to do to solve some of these grand challenges I'd outlined, however, we would prefer to have hundreds to thousands to even millions of polymer samples to screen. Effectively, to produce that many polymers, uh, I would essentially spend my whole career making one library of samples to test against a specific uh, problem. So we need to rethink this current low-throughput approach to discovery of polymers that is really currently limiting our progress in this field. So I would assert that polymer synthesis is very much a field where computer science was in the 1960s and 70s. Computers at that time were incredibly useful. Most famously, the world's most advanced computing system helped NASA run the Apollo 11 missions that put Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong on the moon. Unlike today, however, no one even dreamed of having a computer in their house. At that time, much like in polymer chemistry today, computers, you needed to be a highly trained engineer to even start to use a simple computer. The average, to the average person, computers were no more, nothing more than abstractions that only scientists could use. Things are, of course, quite different today. The personal computing revolution has absolutely changed the way we think about and interact with technology. Beginning with the introduction of the Apple II in 1977, personal computers now provided a user-friendly in interface that finally allowed, allowed non-experts to simply interact with software and not worry so much about the hardware. 
the value of the personal computer is now self-evident. Whether it be the three-year-old you see playing games on the iPad, or the 21-year-old entrepreneur writing the next great platform of software. They don't need to know that their processor is actually control controlled by millions of tiny silicon wires separated in this device by only 14 nanometers that allows uh, charges to be separated and give us memory storage in our computer device. That's a beautiful thing. They don't need to worry about the science under the hood in these instruments. They just need to interact with the graphical interface. So I'm, I'm asserting today that an analogous revolution is required for the synthesis of molecules and polymers. The typical chemist today uses the same tools, flasks, speakers, stir bars, et cetera, that the first practitioners of our discipline were using to make molecules ne nearly 150 years ago. And this field is still accessible only to experts in chemical synthesis. There must be a better way. That is what our research efforts at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology are focused on. We aim to remove chemical synthesis as a bottleneck for discovery efforts in chemistry, biotechnology, and engineering. And we are doing this by rethinking how we conduct chemical reactions. Gone from our lab are the flasks and beakers that you all probably used in high school chemistry lab. We are replacing them with pumps, tubing, and an array of gadgets that allow us to conduct re chemical reactions in an efficient and continuous fashion. We call this new field continuous flow chemistry, and it's changing the way chemists think about making chemical bonds. As an example, here's a continuous flow reaction running in our lab at MIT. Reagents are continuously pumped through this tubing. They mix at what we call a T mixer, and the new chemical bonds are formed in this reactor, which is just a long coil of tubing. Now we can control the reaction time by controlling the pumping rate and the length of tubing. And the combination, um, and then with the technology that we have, have available to us from computer science, we can then control the pumping rate, reaction time, and temperature with software. So now it's this combination of continuous flow chemistry and our ability to write software that allows us to dream of building a machine to make libraries of polymers that we want to test. So previous technology for the automated synthesis of polymers relied on a process that added just one molecule at a time to a growing polymer chain. Now, though, although this was great for making certain types of biological polymers, this technique has inherent limitations due to its low scalability and tedious nature of making long chemical bonds. What, but instead of this low-throughput approach, we envision now an exponential growth process to expedite polymer growth. In other words, we now wanted to design a machine that instead of adding just one molecule at a time, now doubles the molecular weight or the, or the size of a polymer chain in a continuous flowing system. Now we accomplish this task by very carefully controlling the reactivity and identity of the end groups or the end units of this polymer chain. And we use what we call in chemistry protecting groups. And you can think of them as blocking groups. And we know how to control the deprotection or unblocking of that group under very specific conditions. And by using these pr protecting groups to control exactly where we want chemical bonds to be formed, and then these blocking groups to prohibit chemical bonds being formed where we don't want them, this gives us a ne necessary chemistry now to exactly double the size of a polymer. But to accomplish this process using traditional approaches to chemical synthesis, using the same flasks and beakers that you all know from high school chemistry lab, was very tedious. Because for each polymer doubling, you needed to actually perform three separate reactions and three separate purifications. These are the two deprotection steps I told you about and one coupling step. However, we envisioned that using continuous flow chemistry now, we can combine these three reaction and purification steps into a single machine where these tedious steps are accomplished in an uninterrupted fashion without any user intervention. So through careful planning, design, and experimentation, we have been successful in building a machine that runs these three reaction steps and purifications in an uninterrupted sequence. And we call our instrument Flow IEG, which stands for Flow Iterative and Exponential Growth. 
Now this machine accomplishes our goal of doubling a poly the size of a polymer chain in an automated fashion, and all the chemistry within the machine takes place in under 10 minutes. And now, by coupling numerous of these ch machines back to back, we can now quickly construct long polymer chains in very efficient processes. And this is actually what our first generation machine looks like in our lab at MIT. The pumps are contained uh, at, in these white boxes on the left of the image, uh, and we control the heating uh, by using these hot plates and oil baths. Now, when a researcher wants to start the machine, they simply plug all the reagents into the desired ports and press go. They can collect their product then on the far right side of the machine. And although this machine, uh, as it currently sits on our hood, fits about on a tabletop, uh, and is very useful for the studies we do in our lab, we use it almost every day, ideally, we want to open up this technology to people outside our field and make this a really user-friendly instrument. Therefore, we are working with our colleagues in the engineering department at, at MIT to improve the pumping technology, make it much smaller, design new reactor technology, and we envision this machine eventually fitting into something about the size of a carry-on suitcase. Now, in one of our first experiments with our Flow IEG system, we wanted to study the influence of structural isomers on polymer physical properties. And structural isomers are just two molecules that have the exact same atomic composition, but we differ the way in which we connect those chemical bonds. And this is nicely illustrated by the Legos I show on the screen. Each structure has four white and four red blocks. However, by connecting them in different ways, you can see you form vastly different structures that you would envision, if these were molecules, would have different properties. So structural isomers are also very important to polymers, as even small changes in how these building blocks are connected can lead to vastly different physical and mechanical properties. So in our initial study at MIT, we used our polymer synthesis machine, the Flow IEG instrument, to create polymers of 16 repeating units in length, where we're, we were able to perfectly, perfectly control the sequence by controlling when we added these different reagents. Uh, and in the example I'm showing here, we controlled the placement of hydrophobic, or uh, groups that don't like water, represented by the gray spheres in this image, and hydrophilic units, or units that like water, represented by the red spheres in this, in this image. And we were able to construct now two structural isomers. You can see the top polymer, the sequence goes gray, red, gray, red. And the bottom polymer, the sequence goes gray, gray, red, red. And the interesting thing about these two polymers is they actually had very different physical properties. The top polymer uh, is, a, is a viscous liquid at room temperature, so you can see it flow. However, the bottom so polymer is a solid and has very different mechanical and physical properties. And the nice thing about this is if we would use previous technology for polymer synthesis, a study with this type of polymer would be almost impossible to achieve. However, with our new Flow IEG machine, we're easily able to study the influence of things like structural isomers on polymer properties. So now that we have made and tested our new polymer synthesis machine, what can we use it for? Studying how pathogens communicate with our immune system is absolutely vital to understanding and eventually combating disease. And this communication occurs through the binding of saccharide, or what we know better as sugar units, on the outside of a virus or bacteria, to specific cell surface receptors on our immune cells. So synthetic polymers that contain sugars on their backbone are actually very valuable tools for us to start to study uh, the interaction uh, of virus-type molecules uh, with our immune cells. However, this field has been consistently hindered in the past by the difficulty in making these very precisely engineered sugar-containing polymers. But we believe that our new polymer synthesis machine now opens up unique possibilities to rapidly make many different polymer sequences and structures that contain the required sugar units to study pressing problems in immunology. And along with our collaborators, we are working to improve this polymer synthesis machine so now we can make libraries of these sugar-containing polymers, and I don't have to make these, li these libraries of sugar-containing polymers myself. Uh, and we want to study with these the progression of particularly nefarious pathogens such as HIV, tuberculosis, and cholera. And by creating diverse libraries of these sequence-defined sugar-containing polymers, 
we hope we will now have access to the molecular probes necessary to better understand how these pathogens infect and kill our otherwise healthy cells. We are in the middle of an industry-changing revolution, where the tools being created will, will now remove the bottleneck of chemical synthesis in many fields of scientific inquiry. My colleagues and I want to put the power of synthesis into the hands of those who are best able to study the molecules that we, ma we make. Now, to accomplish this task, we are combining the tools of synthetic chemistry, polymer science, and continuous flow chemistry to create automated systems that allow the computer-controlled synthesis of diverse libraries of synthetic polymers. Throughout this work, we hope to usher in a new age of user-driven dri innovations in diverse fields of science, enabled now by this machine-driven construction of complex molecules. The personal computing revolution, if you will, for polymer science. And our synthesis machine is a valuable first step in this direction. It is already allowing us to probe complicated biological interactions in the immune system, and we foresee this as an enabling tool uh, in many disciplines where chemical synthesis has previously been a bottleneck to discovery efforts. I thank you very much for the invitation and your time. Thank you.